So, um, as usual, I'm basically going to use this as a sounding board for the craziest ideas that I could come up with. Uh, well, not, well, some of them just aren't ready for showtime yet, but this is a, you know, something in that direction. This is actually something that's been uh, kind of um, you know, going around in my head for, for quite a while and been annoying me and wanted to share some thoughts on it. But, you know, and as you might have noticed, uh, I haven't really lost my attention for overly dramatic titles. Uh, I don't really intend to. Um, but uh, this talk basically comes from my two big concerns. Uh, one being that everything ultimately fails, and the other is that authoritarianism is pushing us in the direction uh, of what authoritarians uh, deem to be rational utopias. Um, the, uh, uh, see, see, right? So um, I'm just going to start by talking broadly about a few kind of uh, different ideas of, for instance, what do I mean by rational utopia? Then talk a bit about the ways in which these systems can fail, and then combine both into something that looks like a coherent alternative to the major consensus narrative uh, where society is going. Now. The term major consensus narrative, if you don't recognize it, comes from Bruce Sterling, and it means normal. Um, uh, but, you know, there's six chapters, they're numbered, we're going to count down. First, well, what is utopia? Utopia means nowhere. This is not nowhere, this is outside of China, a planned city. It is intended to be a city in which you do not need to uh, drive. Uh, there is no preparation for cars there. And, well, you know, utopia is the idea of the perfect place, the most sought-after state of being. And ut utopians have always existed. The word uh, apparently comes from Plato. Uh, it, in Greek, uh, topia means somewhere or a place. Um, utopia, nowhere, right? Now available in China. Um, and although most of these utopians are kind of dreamy fellows that, you know, have these uh, great empathic, empathic visions of, you know, a bright future for humanity, there's a subclass of them who have seen, you know, their particular Edens uh, as something uh, kind of different. And the core ingredient for these kind of particular uh, rationalist utopians are uh, what, I, what has been called um, high modernism. This is a definition of high modernism from James C. Scott who said that uh, it is a strong version of the self-confidence about scientific and technical progress, the expansion of production, the growing satisfaction with human, of human needs, the mastery of nature, including human nature, and above all, the rational design of social order to, uh, no, sorry, commensurate with the scientific understanding of natural laws. This sounds pretty great, except, you know, the important bit is self-confidence and mastery of nature. So you become very self-confident and then you start to control things. Okay? So, you know, this kind of sounds good, but there's this interesting distinction to be made between scientific and technical progress and the blind and arrogant self-confidence about the issue. Uh, and, you know, uh, my favorite example, you knew I was going to talk about industrialization at some point, right? Um, it's, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution. Um, you know, early industrialists were so fascinated with the technical capacity for development that they really ignored many of the pressing questions regarding the societal and environmental effects of the development. Um, so there was little thought as such put into the effect it would have on the human psyche to be able to traverse the planet you know, within a day or communicate with anybody anywhere regardless of language or other constraints. You know? uh, and I'm not saying that any of that is a bad thing. It's all actually really, really cool. But you know, uh, the fact is that there are a few things that have happened as a consequence of that that maybe if we'd sat and thought about it a little bit longer, they might have turned out a bit nicer. Um, you know, uh, people have been critiquing the Industrial Revolution since it started, in part uh, due to centralizing effects. And, you know, there are, there are interesting side effects and some things have just gone horribly wrong. Hence, um, Ella's talk this morning about uh, how we're heading for a six degree climate uh, temperature raise. So, well, so this kind of high modernist uh, person, like her, uh, <laughs> driven by an ideal, uh, is only really dangerous to um, to their surroundings if they actually gain power. 
Uh, and this doesn't have to be political power, it was in uh, work with Thatcher's case, but it can also be just the power to control any environment. It might be the ability to develop software, right? But um, uh, they, when they come to power, they do so with a sense of confidence in their ability to comprehend the complexity of the reality. Uh, and the, their ability is not, not actually equal to the confidence in their ability. Uh, so, you know, that having looked upon the world and seen all of its great complexity, they say, wow, that really doesn't fit with my ideology. There's just too much stuff. So they take what they can and fit it into the ideology, and then they uh, take anything else and kind of try to shoehorn it in. Uh, and you know, either shoehorning by, uh, by miscategorization, you know, taking things and just putting them in the wrong box, or by simply trying to change the nature of the thing that uh, they observe as not fitting into their, their ideology. And, well, so, I mean, there's lots and lots of examples of that. Um, the, uh, one example is um, what happens to social services when uh, uh, libertarians get into power. Right. You know. um, oh, those don't ha belong anywhere. Let's just get rid of them. You know, um, uh, have you heard of the big society? Uh, David Cameron's idea of uh, yeah, right. We need to uh, cut down on the on the UK budget. Let's just do that and uh, just shut down all these services, and uh, society will take care of itself. Right. Despite being dis having been disenfranchised for so many hundreds of years, that you know the the social structures do, do not exist to actually grab that slack. So, okay, what do we mean by rationality? Because, you know, if we're going to talk about rational utopias, we need to define uh, rationality. Well, so, uh, through a process of rationalized shoehorning, the rational utopia begins to kind of take shape. But, first, when we say rational, we do not mean right. right? Uh, it means the outcome of the process of rationalization. So rationality in itself is not bad. I, I'm a big fan of rationality. But uh, when it's stringently applied, it is subject to flaws coming from erroneous assumptions. So you have a bunch of axioms, you have a bunch of basic beliefs, and if any of those one belief, uh, or any of those beliefs are wrong, then the entire thing breaks down. Right? Um, we can talk about that in a little bit, but first let's come to an example. So. Um, Rationality does not imply any systemic viability. There's all sorts of things that we can you know, agree would be rational, the rational steps. It is rational for all of us to start using, well, for everybody in the world to use free software, right? right? It's also rational for everybody to encrypt their hard drives, right? And it would be good, you know, completely rational to stop using fossil fuels and stop waging wars and be vegetarian, right? But even if you know, even these great ideas, if we start to forcefully imply them through the wrong kind of mechanism, uh, you know, such as making meat illegal, that would be, you know, one way of forcing everybody to become vegetarian, which is quite a, you know, rational endpoint. But, you know, it would, first off, it would <coughs> kill a massive section of our economy, it would lead to uh, a massive overpopulation of several species, such as the cows and such, and whatnot, and it would lead to a very bizarre food crisis. Yeah. We, we, you just can't take that step in one step, and even if you did, all of the bacon lovers out there, they would not be <coughs> pleased. Right? So, you know, you, you, first is you need the societal consensus, and you need to graduate the the uh, switch over, no matter what it is. Um, you know, if you if you were to uh, ban meat, then suddenly the price of broccoli might skyrocket. It would, uh, you know, and in the same way, for you know, a, a kind of. Uh, presidential decree forcing everybody to encrypt their hard drives would just lead to a massive upswing in data loss because you know people who are accustomed to having to use passphrases, well they just suddenly you know have to use passphrases all of a sudden and, and then uh, their newly secured devices become so secure they can't get their data. You know you need to you need to go through the process of teaching all of this and and kind of uh, changing society at its core. And, you know, uh, likewise, if we were to stop using fossil fuels tomorrow, there's the really weird economic impact of, uh, of you know, suddenly there's a massive over-availability of fossil fuels, uh, there's a massive under-availability of other forms of, of energy, and there's the weird problem of having to decide what to do with hundreds of millions of internal combustion engines that are scattered all over the world. 
right? So in that case, the environmentalism drives a chain of obsolescence which kind of goes against environmentalism. Weird, right? Um, so all of these kind of good things can be achieved, but they, they can't be the result of an overnight change, and, uh, and they should not be coerced. And the problem with the high modernists is that they tend to see some kind of pathway to utopia as a logical series of steps, which can be decided on unilaterally, without consensus from from the people. And you know, rather as a uh, so instead of a smooth transition coming from a natural and gradual change in the major consensus narrative, that is to say, the uh, general public understanding of what is normal, you you have this kind of hey, let's suddenly decide this. And this keeps happening over history. But who? Who did that? Well, remember these guys? Uh, you know, there's lots and lots of historical examples. Uh, I mean, I could mention Margaret Thatcher, as I already have, uh, Evo Morales, uh, Lenin, Stalin, Putin, right? Uh, David Opson in Iceland, uh, Barack Obama, right? See, you were expecting a completely different list. Uh, you could say Gaddafi. Have you read his Green Book? Amazing literature. I'm really glad he didn't implement it. But at the same time, it would have been <laughs> awesome if he had. Right? You know, uh, it's, it's a big book. Um, Ronald Reagan, Reaganomics. Right? You know, it's, it's sudden, sudden cutdowns. And you know, there's all sorts of people uh, who, who kind of share the fact that they're kind of leaders by vision, in the sense that they have this great vision for what the society should be like, and they come in and they try to enforce, uh, impose their vision on, on reality. And um, sometimes they come up with their own vision, sometimes it comes from somebody else. So, um, you know, they're strong leaders with strong ideologies. Uh, some of them managed to restructure society towards their rational utopia. Some managed to create the impression that they arrived at their rational utopia or that it already exists. And then others get foiled in their attempts and... Um, then often as much by their own ineptitude as their um, uh, as being foiled by their adversaries. And important in all of this is that, that these people are not necessarily evil. You know, the, being a rational utopian does not make you evil. It doesn't even make you stupid or ignorant. It just means that you believe that you can create a utopia by imposing your will on the world. Right? Uh, you could even say that all of these people consider themselves to be the good guys. And in some ways they kind of are, but still, we need to be careful of them. So, I mean, this guy, not a rational <laughs> right? Um And there's lots of others who have been kind of uh, leaders both, uh, both uh, completely uh, accepted and very much unaccepted, uh, who are not rational utopians, so that kind of gives you the contrast. Um, Bill Clinton, also not a rational utopian. John Major in, in UK, Bertie Ahern in Ireland, uh, Jens Stoltenberg in Norway. All of them were, uh, were, uh, were or are leaders by progression as opposed to leaders by vision. Instead of trying to impose a vision on the world, they try to kind of slowly shift what is considered normal. And you know, some of them are evil, some of them are not, but you know, there's overlap, hence this, right? So you have the evil people, the rationalists, there's some overlap. Utopians, non-utopians, no overlap, right? Okay. So, okay, why am I going on about this? What, what, what does this have to do with any of this? Because, I mean, is this a free software, free society conference? Well, okay, so there is a problem. Um, generally speaking, you can't have multiple rational utopia uh, coexisting, it seems. Uh, they, unless they are structurally compatible with one another. And generally, if you have political strife, if you have you know, the conflict between left and right, the conflict, conflict between competing ideologies, they'll kind of arrive at a balance and there won't be a kind of massive shift towards some kind of ra radical, uh, rational utopian ideal. Uh, but when, uh, whenever one ideology becomes dominant, you know, whether it's Thatcherite neoliberalism or Leninist communism or whatever it is, then other ideologies kind of get shifted out. They, they become insignificant by comparison. And so that's how you get the, kind of the rise of fascism, for instance, or uh, you know, any kind of uh, uh, edge case. And um, you know, I, I, I commented that, uh, at a thing two, two years ago at Tefiscons that you know, uh, the, there is a tendency for 
uh, ideological extremism to flourish after the aftermath of uh, in the aftermath of financial collapse. So you can go through this: economic collapse leads to nationalism, leads to war. You can see this uh, in the Napoleonic Wars with the uh, uh, changes going on in Europe then, uh, the lead up to both World War One, World War Two, uh, and virtually every war in history has been you know had that kind of progression leading up to it. And you are here, right? You see this. <laughs> We, we see this with uh, Golden Dawn, the Dawn in Greece, we see it with Party for Freiheit in, in the Netherlands, and you know, all over the place. And you know, uh, We've got this massive upswing of extremism, even in Sweden. Uh, and you know, this historic, historically speaking, an increase in extremism tends to amplify the control until war breaks out. Normally the war becomes a kind of resetting me mechanism for society. That's not really good. So, you know, this is kind of why I'm, I'm talking about this, because, you know, we, we're seeing um, all these utopian visions becoming more prominent. In particular, far-right extremism uh, has been kind of uh, being driven by, by the kind of Randroid, Randian uh, philosophy <laughs> in recent years. You know, it's, uh, there, there's this, been this kind of strengthening of that, while at the, in the left you've got uh, within the Occupy movement, for instance, uh, a strangely kind of almost Kaczynskiite uh, form of, of primitivist anti-capitalism emerging. And thankfully it's not uh, super prevalent or super dominant, but you know, you kind of go like, wow, I mean, have you read the Unabomber Manifesto? Anybody? Right? Uh, it's kind of scary how many parallels uh, you can find within you know, having conversations with many of the occupiers. <laughs> it's, it's scary. So, you know, at every side. And, at the same time, we, we see that more technology seems to make utopias or uh, rational utopias more viable. Um, uh, you know, strong memes seem to be becoming more resilient. Information access speed is causing faster dissemination of ideas, hostile to ruling lights. Um, the cheaper technology is making the implementation of rational utopia econo more economically viable. So it becomes easier and easier to impose your will on people if you have the power to. Uh, to uh, control the budget, or something like that, right? And um, this doesn't just happen in politics, right? This is also happening in in computers, uh, in design, and, and uh, you know information management systems. So uh, we, we kind of there's this massive high modernist bent uh, surrounding these little things, uh, you know, the amplification of consumer experiences, uh, siloed computer programs, you know. Com completely incapable of interacting with one another, except on a completely rudimentary level, uh, often through fiat of the underlying user interface uh, paradigm. So you, you have this kind of cell phone, and it has this app, and you kind of like, where's the pipe function? Like, why, why can't I pipe the output from this app over to that other app? Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't work. And the creators of the applications you know, are, are through both that siloing and, and through the kind of uh, the logic of the app store, uh, they're, they're holding and retaining a very high degree of control over uh, both the actions of the program and the user who's using it. So this is actually kind of undermining free software on a completely more nefarious level than just uh, not allowing access to the code, because you know in the mobile phone environment, you know. It's not enough to just open up the, the source code to liberate the user. The use, study, share, and prove, no, use just got violated because the operating system says so. And uh, that, in that way, you have this kind of tyranny of a user experience where, where the, uh, the user interface is preventing you from you know, doing whatever you might, might want to do. Um, well, uh, I worry that that might actually be making the traditional idea of free software somewhat obsolete in this model or in this kind of context. I hope I'm wrong, but you know we need to act, uh, do some navel gazing on that one. Um, and then, alongside all this, you know another example of how easy it's becoming to control people is you know we we see rampant increases in surveillance and the expansion of powers of three and four letter acronym organizations. You know, prevalence of CCTV systems, increased use of biometrics and identification and authentication of, uh, you know, of everybody and everything, and increased censorship of uh, communications mediums. I mean, just last week in Russia, uh, a new censorship law was passed, and Russia is not the first country this year. 
to do that. Uh, and all of this is kind of leading to a severe democratic deficit. So, you know, the rational utopia enforcement devices are springing up everywhere. Most of us have them in our pockets. They're all over the campus. What can we do? And there's a caveat here. Um, so, we could say, well, you know, uh, all of that stuff might, uh, might just as easily be the result of a completely non-utopian scheme. Uh, you know, it could be driven by greed and corruption, uh, just uh, power plays and whatnot, and it definitely is, actually. And I'm not trying to suggest that this kind of high modernism idea is, is at the rotten core of all of society's problems. I'm saying more that, you know, it is a factor that does play a role, and we haven't really been looking at it. It's kind of, it's an underlying subtlety, and, you know, which is why I'm bringing this up. Okay. So if we look through some of the, the utopian ideas which are driving this, uh, we see kind of things like uh, no terrorism at any cost, right? And what is the cost of that to us? Uh, we, we see, uh, you know, united Europe at any cost, you know, and the Euro European Union gets strengthened and, and whoops, you know, what happens to, to these centers. And, you know, we even see, you know, no organized crime at any cost, and suddenly we have all sorts of uh, you know, increased police powers to investigate people at random, and we see, hey, no gender imbalance at any cost, and you know, this is in, intended to kind of reduce gender inequality and to promote feminism and all that, which is great, but you know, uh, what is the cost of, of doing that if it's always enforced up from above? Right? We, so, you know, there's all these different utopias coming up, all of them with good intent. I mean, having no terrorism is a really good, good and noble goal, but are we really getting what we're asking for? And some of the utopian visions, you know, I mean, it, most of it has honest aims. Well, most, of it, most of it is trying to do something good, but it is a manipulation of the major consensus narrative. It, it is kind of uh, a twisting and tweaking of what we consider normal. And, you know, suddenly now we think it's normal to have spying devices in our pockets, and and cameras all over the place. Because that way we stop terrorism or something. And you know, it's what's being done to achieve these goals that's actually worrying me. So ultimately, how does all this stuff fail? Because that's that's the, the core of it. Um, you know, maybe these rational utopias, if they wouldn't fail, then then it would be good, right? We, we get rationality, we get utopia, everybody's happy. But no. Um, first is the set of axiomatic failure modes, where um, you have this kind of presumptive understanding that, uh, that, uh, that you understand the whole system, you understand everything that's going on in the world, and how it should be best organized and operated. And, and well, so the, uh, there's three categories of failure modes that I kind of run, want to run through. First is the uh, failure mode of um, so axiomatic failure. Then there's a kind of a theorem level failure, which is what happens when you derive some statements or understanding from your axioms. And then there's kind of the more systemic failures. So uh, as examples of axiomatic failures, you have the problem of invalid economic assumptions. For instance, you uh, start to assume that a 2% inflation rate is a stable thing over all of you know, future history. And, well, you know, might be true, might not be true. Uh, invalid social dynamics assumptions, you assume that, uh, that you're going to have the same age distribution of people forever. Uh, or you assume that uh, there's always going to be the same per percentage of people in schools, or same number of active people in the workforce, or heck, that uh, unemployment rates of 5% of are going to be sustainable forever. Yeah? Uh, and we, we're actually seeing one of the breakdowns in that in the pension systems around the world now. So many people are suddenly becoming too old, and all these pension systems have been running on the assumption that, you know, that they, uh, it'll always be replenished with a new, new group of people. Then you have involved resource assumptions. You say, oh no, we've got enough oil to last us another 50 years. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, the fact that they're drying up you know, all of the oil uh, things completely coincidental. Um, you start making invalid assumptions about human behavior. Oh no, it's fine, everybody wants to uh, live in a city where there's no cars, and they will not try to bring cars into the crazy, awesome, utopian Chinese city by uh, some 
some means, you know, whatever means necessary. Then there's, you know, assumptions about your ability to govern, the ability to control all of this, so, you know, even the ability to, uh, to monitor everything that's going on. I mean, currently there's 500,000 CCTV cameras in London, and, well, has that changed the crime, uh, crime patterns? Not really. Has it changed the, uh, uh, well, what has it changed actually? Well, so non-violent crime has moved just up the street to where there's no cameras. Violent crime hasn't changed at all. And the uh, frequency of both of these is completely the same as before. Then you have uh, infrastructure viability assumptions that are completely broken. Hurricane Sandy just kind of proved that one pretty well. Uh, that, oh yes, uh, our, our infrastructure is fine, we don't have to do anything, we don't have to build new, uh, new stuff to, uh, to replace all the stuff that's breaking down. Uh, it's going to be fine, right? And, uh, well, the, uh, so the theoretical failure modes uh, kind of uh, inspired by Gödel, first off, incompleteness. You, you assume that your grand vision for the world is going to be complete and, and completely holistic. There's going to be no assumptions or statements that you can make that will violate the system. You can have the Russellian uh, thing where if you believe two things to be true and they in inherently contradict each other. Um, have you ever listened to or read through any neoliberal uh, economic textbooks? Really funny. Normally chapter one is where it starts. Um, the, or the first couple of pages in any macroeconomics textbook always starts by talking about the fact that um, uh, there's an assumption of scarcity. You assume that everything is scarce, and there it kind of breaks down. Um, <laughs> you know, information isn't scarce, damn it! Then you have the Darwinian thing. I call it the Darwinian failure mode because um, uh, uh, if you read Kropotkin, one of his complaints was that um, you know, Darwin didn't actually say that uh, this survival of the fittest thing. He didn't say that, uh, that it's always a, a competition. He said, you yeah, uh, there seems to be competition between species, but inside of each species there seems to be collaboration. And Kropotkin was kind of focusing on the collaboration bit because everybody who read and interpreted Darwin in the first couple of years after the publication was kind of po uh, uh, focusing on, oh, there's competition. Yeah, that makes sense, right? So uh, now we have this kind of uh, offspring in the form of social Darwinism and so on, and you're, you're kind of overstating the implications of, of what evolution means. The same happens in, in all of these uh, ideas. Uh, Yes, if we, uh, if we just uh, you know, change society in this way, then the implications will be vast. We, we might uh, be able to, um, I don't know, I, I didn't come up with a great example for this one, but uh, I'm sure you can think of the ways in which it could happen. Uh, then Pareto, and, um, so if you don't know Pareto, uh, 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 he was an uh, economist, um, not many people know that he was actually uh, appointed uh, through presidential fiat to parliament for, uh, in Italy uh, to serve for the uh, fascist party. So if you think about all of the stuff that we uh, focus on, on Pareto efficiency and, and uh, scalability, then, uh, and put it through, okay, what does this mean to a fascist? It's quite interesting. So um, one, one failure that often happens is that people see that something works in their small group of friends and think, hey, it would be really cool if all society did this. <laughs> Have we seen this anywhere? <laughs> uh, XMPP? Okay. Uh, then, then there's uh, Parkinsonian. Uh, Parkinson, uh, the guy who wrote uh, Parkinson's Law, uh, he, um, he pointed out what we now call bike shedding in this group. Uh, we uh, overlook the really complicated bits and just focus on the bits that we really understand. Right? Um, this is something that the, the uh, rational utopians do all the time. And actually, it kind of makes all of us we have a little rational utopian inside us. <laughs> yeah, right? we, we throw away anything that's too complicated and just go, yeah, it would be really cool if we could have that button in green. You know? So, um, Rousseau's. Then, of course, there's the systemic failure modes, and those normally have to do with the manipulation of, of graphs. So you start to assume uh, a specific structure of society, how people are interconnected, um, and you know, in that kind of thing, uh, you might go like Marx did uh, and say, well, you know, it's a battle between classes, 
and in many cases it's right. But as, you know, sometimes you don't actually have that much of a class stratified society, like say Scandinavia. Scandinavia does kind of have a, a class thing, but not all that much. And talking about it is the way you would about a uh, 19th century Britain, just doesn't really have much sense to it. Then you have uh, graph malleability assumptions. The, the idea that, say, for instance, if you assume that uh, social mobility is, is something that's a given, then you know everything that you build based on that assumption will kind of fail when you find groups of society or within society that don't actually have social mobility, right? Um, and then the assumption of operational closure, uh, the, uh, which is kind of uh, whatever we do, it will have effects that only reflect within the system. The outputs are completely kind of uh, the outputs of whatever we do will. Uh, lead to things which we can actually continue to do stuff with. Um, the, the example here would be uh, the, the creation of the gold standard or uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement or anything like that. Any major manipulation of the economy has always uh, been uh, working on the assumption that uh, you can do things and the output will be understandable from that, from that basis. Then uh, assumption of homeostasis, that's just, uh, yeah, things won't crash. <laughs> um, this is kind of what brought down Iceland, by the way. Um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll just take, keep taking loans and, and buying stuff, order the loans, and take more loans with that. Uh, yeah, and you know, if you work on the assumption that you can just keep on doing this forever and the system will remain stable and viable, or you know, at least within a homeostatic uh, system, then it's fine, right? But then one day. It, your, your control point in the system just flies out through, through all of the barriers and, and you suffer a major, a major economic crash or something worse. And then the assumption of viability. The, the idea, um, here's kind of where I, I kick the androids once more, uh, is you know, yeah, it's going to be completely viable if we uh, just throw away all of the state just overnight and uh, you know, just let people fend for themselves. It's going to be great. You know, uh, let's uh, look past the fact that, uh, for instance, when you have uh, uh, ferries uh, that are you know, moving people between places and these are massively subsidized, and not only are the ferries subsidized, but the creation of the harbors are subsidized and the operation and whatnot. And suddenly, if you throw away all of the uh, governmental infrastructure, then, well, okay, people will probably keep showing up to work. We saw that in Belgium when they stopped having a government, remember? <laughs> that was actually pretty cool. I mean, you throw away the government and the entire thing stays up. Uh, that was kind of an assumption of viability that nobody had made. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, the, the other example is, you know, you throw away the government and the budget and the taxing mechanism, and then you say, wait, so who's going to pay for the new uh, modifications to the harbour and, and the fuel for the boats? Are we going to sell tickets for 30 times what they cost before? You know, I mean, sure, you might eventually get there. You might say, yes, I have the libertarian ideal that you know, everything should be privatized, but if you do it overnight, then things are going to be really messy for a while. And, oh, whoops. So, uh, finally, this is the decentralization track after all. So what does this have to do with decentralization? Um, well, first off, what it doesn't have to do with decentralization. Um, one thing, we, uh, you know, we seem to think that uh, centralized control systems are, uh, no, that centralized control systems are more likely to cost rational utopias. But decentralized systems can be used to hinder the spread of high modernism, uh, but uh, mostly through the way of uh, decentralized societies tend to be more messy and therefore harder to control. But crypto hierarchies do tend to emerge in, in uh, decentralized societies. A crypto hierarchy being, uh, you know, even though we agree that Anonymous is the leader, then there is that guy that everybody listens to, right? And he has some friends, and they, everybody listens to them as well. You know? uh, so that, that's kind of a, a, a self-emergent hierarchy, and it's a it's a bit of a implicit control mechanism. So in these kind of uh, parliamentary settings and in the formation of nation states, you always have a explicit leader and an explicit control mechanism. But uh, within kind of decentralized networks, we often have the implicit control mechanism instead. And that doesn't necessarily have to be worse or better. 
Um, so one example there is that you know it is insufficient to assume that if we have a decentralized uh, society, then we won't have rational utopias emerging. Mimetic drift uh, or perturbations in major uh, consensus narrative can cause entire societies to suddenly be beholden to a rational utopian idea. Um, the examples, well, you know, the Salem witch hunt. You know, we have we deserve to live in a society without witches, right? And everybody jumps on that bandwagon, and suddenly you have this kind of rational utopia, uh, but it's being being controlled by not exactly anybody in particular. Uh, and McCarthyism, uh, I know that's slightly ironic, um, but you know we deserve to live in a country without communists, or or you know you have segregation or apartheid. You know, we we deserve to live in a country where different races don't interact with one another. And chauvinism, we deserve to live in a country where men rule everything. You know, any of these ideas kind of becomes a bandwagony thing, and it's not really as if any one person just sat down and decided this should be the way it goes. Decentralist, uh, decentralized societies can be prone to this. But, um, you know, and, and they're always driven by explicitly, implicit leaders. But, on the other hand, there is an interesting offering that uh, decentralization may have that could stem this tide. Protocols. Our favorite thing. <laughs> so, uh, linguistic model, you know, Noam Chomsky, uh, you know, uh, proposed for de dealing with the different complexity of languages, tells us quite a lot of things about how the world works. Um, one result from complexity theory that I really love is that uh, every language, whether it's a regular language or a context-free language or context-sensitive language or uh, anything like that, free language, um, is always uh, functionally equivalent to some automata. There is some automata of some description which is uh, which it is equivalent to. Meaning, you can always build a machine that is equivalent to some language and vice versa. Right? What does that mean? Well, this is a picture of a language. I love that. Um, it means that you can, you know, describe every every machine functionality with a minimum grammar of some kind, and that every language, whether it's human language or computer language, can somehow be processed mechanically. And the side effects of that, you know, the, one of them is uh, comes from the sapir whorf hypothesis. That um, uh, do you know that? Basically, it says uh, in a stronger version, which is absolute nonsense, that you cannot think of anything that you cannot describe with the language. And of course, that means that creativity doesn't work. The weaker version is much more sensible. It says, if you cannot express something in the language that you know, then you are unlikely to come up with it. You might still do it, and that would be creativity. But if you if you just can't describe it, then you know, you're know you going to think about something else by default. Right? This is why creativity is so hard, and why thinking abstractly is so interesting. Um, and uh, you could say that our language through its structure is kind of st uh, slightly inhibiting certain types of thought. So, society is a bit of a machine. And we say, well, you know, it's, a, it's an automatic of some description, it's very highly complex, but can we describe it? Can we actually say this machine should be described as language? We can't really do that. I mean, how are we going to explain uh, Say the politics of uh, of uh, nuclear arms and and uh, uh, so on through uh, through some kind of grammar. It's it's very complicated, and it. But at the same time, its components can be described. So whether we're interacting with a bottle opener or a skyscraper, or a government institution or a street merchant, all of these things have a certain underlying grammar to what we're trying to do. And if we put the grammar into a certain context, that's where we get a protocol. A protocol is simply uh, a, a, the ability to send something to somebody and it is understood. And if you get that bidirectionally, you get a conversation. So, you know, computer scientists, hackers, we're all crazy about protocols, you know, and there's lots of them. Uh, we, we see political parties have a certain logic to them. We see um, uh, government institutions have a logic to them. And some of the protocols are really vague and implicit, and some of them are really explicit and well-defined. 
and some are subject to the feelings of the people who are working in the institutions on that given day. Some are subject to whims and corruption and, and our experiences of one another. But the, you know, um, well, first off, I mean, the, the interactions between two people who just run into each other on the street corner, you know, might know each other passingly. They're completely different from the way you interact with your tax office. And um, so when, when we're communicating over computers, we have this nice <coughs> model of you know, being able to put everything into a kind of very clear, very well-defined uh, language. And, and it's great. You know, we get HTML, we get TCP IP, you know, and, and so on. But then we have law. And law is a protocol as well. It's kind of a, a social convention on how we interact with one another. And there's also these other uh, things such as government interactions. So, you know, taxes go into the government, the government uh, uh, funds welfare and warfare, infrastructure and extrastructure. And, well, then we say, okay, but what's the protocol of the tax office? And more importantly, can we replace the tax office with a peer-to-peer -peer network? Can we, you know, can we just take all of the functionality, all of the things that the tax office is supposed to do, and replace it with some kind of uh, communications protocol. Can we do that for healthcare, with, uh, for the summoning of doctors and the provision of, of medical supplies? Could we do it for you know, any, any system, education or uh, law enforcement, whatever, uh, courts? And, uh, you know, one problem is this stuff is very rarely made explicit. We never really write out exactly what the tax office does. We very rarely you know, try to understand what the Environmental Protection Bureau is trying to do in very formal you know, BNF grammars. Maybe we should. I'm not sure it would actually work because we don't know the complexity class and so on, but you know, there's that option. But either way, you know, whichever way you turn it, we have the internet. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, all of these things are kind of compatible with the internet. The fact that we can communicate with our governments through online forums proves that this is possible. So, you know, every government institution, every, every function of society is a machine of some kind. It has inputs, it has outputs, it has a processing mechanism. And if we can figure out the communications protocol, then we can start to decentralize it in such a way that it cannot be controlled. Is this a rational utopia? Maybe it is. <laughs> but cutting out the middleman does sound like a good idea because you know we, we have this old saying you know we reject kings and presidents of voting and and you know more specifically we kind of are in favor of, of decentralizing society a bit that's kind of where where a lot of us come from ideologically and maybe we can build one which isn't subject to uh, this kind of crazy enforcement so uh, <coughs> I don't know how we are for time. Uh, you have time, there's no speech after this. Right, yep. yeah. but uh, actually there's a crowdsource session. <laughs> You're going to in, in two minutes. Okay, okay. well in that case I'll skip the, the bonus chapter. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, well, well uh, Alan and I will be talking about this at CCC, so uh, that'll be fun. Um, uh, but it, it has a weird story. Uh, but. I don't know, maybe this entire thing is kind of crazy, maybe, I don't know, but uh, if you have any questions or, or comments, I would love to hear them. Okay, thanks. Yes, hi. Hi, yeah, that was really fascinating. I'm just, let me see, there's a lot there, so, um, <laughs> but it seems to me something like taxes, right, which are um, embedded in administrative structure and bureaucratic structure, does have a protocol, right? I mean, it's it's heavily protocolized, yes. right? It may not be a decentralized one; it's a very centralized, right. One, right? So there's just that. I was a little bit um, confused as to why you were sort of saying like we must put a, a protocol on. No, no, no. I wasn't saying we need to. Put a protocol. I'm saying there is a grammar already there, but we haven't formalized the grammar. Okay, but it seems like it's highly formalized. I mean, that's why I go to my accountant who knows right. the formal okay. system, yeah. and you know, just like I don't have yeah. an intimate understanding of all the protocols of the internet, but you know, you could explain it to me. My wonderful, wonderful tax accountant 
you know, he knows the American system, yeah. the Canadian system can, right? And it's well, what, what I mean is, uh, it's not, when I say highly formalized, I mean formalized so much that I could sit down and write a C application that would, you know, like, hack out a program that can speak the language. Right, but that's slightly different. I mean, it's not uh, modular, perhaps, uh, or modifiable. No, just, not, just not explicitly structured. I mean, well, you know, it, there is a, there's levels of explicitness, I guess. But. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's very explicit. It's just perhaps not modular or modifiable, and that's yeah. slightly different because there's a tax book and a tax code, and it's, sure. it's highly explicit. That's the only reason why it actually kind of works and why the IRS yeah. is able to kind of find people and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, sure, I, I, I don't disagree. What I'm saying is more like um, we can maybe figure out ways of, of writing the protocol down in such a clear way that we can you know, have a uh, computer-based communications protocol and then decentralize it. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. All right. So, so maybe maybe this is a kind of use of language issue, Yeah. but yeah. I, I just uh, think that when you, you present it again, it, it is highly formalized. It's yeah. just not formalized in the way that you want it formalized, right, right. which is a different type of formalization yeah. one, which is basically, you know, perhaps hackable, modifiable, modular, yes. these sorts of qualities that go with what we tend to like about the internet, okay. right? But then, I mean, so that was just a kind of thing about language, I guess. But then, I guess that's the second part of my um, comments, which is, as a social scientist, and, you know, what you gave was also a kind of social scientific sort of um, rendition, on the one hand, social scientists have learned that we can understand the protocols of society, we can hack them, right? right. These sorts yep. of things. But it's also the case that it seems to be that there's a kind of, like in your own presentation, a little bit of a sort of confidence or hubris that we really can. Yeah. You know what I mean? I no, guess that's absolutely. why you say that you're perhaps one of these utopianists. Yes. But I'm actually of the sort of belief that, ma'am, there's true limits as to what we can know and how we can know it. And there's a wonderful book, actually, on science called Ignorance, which is like the more we know, the less we know, and, you know, it leads us to ask more questions. Yeah. And I think we're in the same situation with the social sciences as well, not just the hard sciences, yeah. right? So how do you build in that recognition of, like, utter complexity and unpredictability right. and contingency and unexpected outcomes of whether it's technology or social interactions into your mind? Right. So, I never claimed not to be a rational utopian, <laughs> uh, but uh, I did say that we need to figure out the ways of making sure rational utopians can never get any power. <laughs> right. And uh, the way I'm proposing to do that is to decentralize everything as much as possible uh, as a way of just making it, the, the acquisition of power a harder thing to do. So that, that's kind of my point. So, Never give me any power, <laughs> but, but also beware of people who have similar ideas and ideologies. Right. No, and that part yeah. is yeah. No. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, languages are kind of very closely, and protocols are very closely connected to algorithms, yes. and they have complexities. Yes. So not only have you the complex, do you have the complexity of the language, <coughs> if it's a regular language or a context break, but you also have. Comple complex classes of those algorithms, mm -hmm. especially the tax office, might actually be MP complete. Yes. In which case you're in deep shit. Actually, it might be worse. It might be AI complete. It might be something that we don't know how to do at right. all. Um, no. And I guess that kind of connects to what you were saying. It might just be impossible. There might be hard limits on what we can actually really do. Yes, I, I agree. Um, so, I mean, one of the exercises, you know, if you want homework, is you know just start staring a bit at your your uh, you know environment and and you know some of these protocols are going to be really simple. There's going to be a regular language or two hidden in the the governmental system, right? But yes, there might be things which are uh, you know completely NP complete or or worse. Uh, there might be com uh, things which are absolutely mind blowingly weird. Um, uh, have you ever looked at the... No, uh, okay, I'm not going to go into Scandinavian healthcare politics. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there, there is just stuff that just doesn't make any sense. But, you know, knowing exactly what the complexity class of every institution there is, that would be really useful in and of itself. Yeah. I think one of the limits that you'll run into when you try and really formally analyze how government works, how an institution works, is people deliberately have sort of holes in the system. Yeah. 
where things fall out and you end up talking to a judge and he makes a decision. Yeah. And we, we have this all over in our social structure that it's not a machine. Mm -hmm. It's a machine most of the time for the average case. Yeah. And then when you deviate too far from that, you know, you can't afford to pay your loans or you're going to jail because you're a criminal or something, then there's a non-systemic element where human judgment comes into play. Right. And you interact with peers on an emotional level. And that's fine because we can throw exceptions. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, I mean, yes. You know, I, I, uh, one of the things I, I really don't want to do is end up throwing out the humanity from the system because you know, uh, computers just aren't doing that bit very well. But at the same time, there's lots of these systems that just don't need the human element, and we're currently having you know, just by introducing the human element. Currently, in some of the systems, it just leads to. Way, uh, ways of uh, you know, more control points plus corruption and possibilities and, and so on. So, no, I, I agree. I agree. Anything else? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, as one point, uh, the next session.